Well, my bit of the UK in a changing Europe program, and indeed the focus of the centre, which I direct in Edinburgh, the Centre on Constitutional Change, is about the territorial dimension of this, how it impacts across the different parts of the UK and indeed the UK and Ireland, or how it affects what the Irish like to call the totality of relationships amongst the peoples of these islands. And our concern then is to get away from the Westminster Whitehall South of England perspective on this and see this from other points of view. And the repercussions of Brexit on the different parts of the United Kingdom and Ireland are in fact very, very different indeed. And this is something we keep on having to remind the folks in London, we're around here. This is not just about the South of England. This is a much more complex set of issues. Some of the issues are to do with substantive policy questions. The situation is different in different parts of the United Kingdom, whether it's Scotland, Northern Ireland, Wales, or the regions of England or London. Some of them are constitutional. Now, the substantive issues have to do with economic matters. Different parts of the United Kingdom have different economic sectors. They may be exposed differently to European and international markets. Agriculture may be more important in Northern Ireland, less important in England. Uh, industrial sectors may be important in different parts of the United Kingdom. European funding is particularly important in Wales, much more so than in Scotland. Uh, migration is a big issue in some parts of England. It's not a salient political issue uh, in Scotland. In Northern Ireland, it plays out differently because of the issue of the border and the relationship with the Republic of Ireland. So the reasons for voting one way or another in the referendum were multiform. We know that, and many of them had very little to do with Europe, but they changed around different parts of the United Kingdom, and that partly explains the very different results we got in different parts of the UK with Scotland, Northern Ireland, and London voting to remain, Wales, uh, and large parts of England voting to leave. But my main concern in this project is about the constitutional implications of Brexit and the fact that it's not simply a question of the UK versus, versus Europe or the United Kingdom's relationship to Europe, but the relationship of a complex UK constitution which over the last 20 years has been radically altered with devolution and the movement towards something looking like a federal United Kingdom, the way that links into the European project itself. Now, the relationship between Europe and devolution is something that, again, we keep on having to remind our friends in London uh, is there. It is deeply uh, implicated. The two are intricately, intricately uh, involved, and changing the relationship of the UK to Europe changes the internal constitution of the United Kingdom in potentially quite radical ways. So over the last 20 years, we've got a Scottish Parliament, a Welsh Assembly, a Northern Ireland Assembly, a London Mayor, a London Assembly, moves towards some kind of city regionalism uh, in England. And they've all taken place within UK membership of the European Union. That provides a framework. Take that away, and the UK in some ways starts coming apart at the seams. In fact, if I was going to be provocative, I'd say the European Union is one of the few things that holds the United Kingdom together at the moment. <laughs> For example, because of the European framework, there's a much more extensive system of devolution than otherwise would have been possible. There are no UK departments or policies in agriculture, environmental policy, education, higher education, because many of these things, not education, but certainly parts of higher education, agriculture, regional policy, much of economic policy, they're taken care of by Europe. So we have a single UK market because we have a single European market. And we don't have UK-wide policies across a range of fields because we don't need them, because Europe does for that. Now the question arises, what happens when you take Europe away? Do we need to put in place UK-wide systems UK-wide policies, UK-wide structures to deal with these issues, or do we go for a further 
radical decentralization of the United Kingdom. Uh, a second effect is that Europe is all about divided sovereignty, multiple levels of government, different spheres of government, sharing authority at multiple levels. And that's the way the United Kingdom has become in the last 20 years, in a very untidy and asymmetrical way. This gives a really different view on slogans like take back control if you're in Northern Ireland or Scotland or if you're in England, because in England it's fairly clear. Take back control to Westminster or take back control to the British people. Uh, but that's not obvious in the peripheral parts of the United Kingdom. Uh, and Europe, because it brings in all these ideas about shared and divided sovereignty, provides a new vocabulary and a new way of thinking that helps cope with the fact that the United Kingdom is a multinational union and that the Republic of Ireland is tied into it in very, very complex ways. This is absolutely critical in relation to the peace settlement in Northern Ireland, which is rooted on the idea that both the UK and the Republic of Ireland will suspend their claims about sovereignty. They'll suspend disbelief in the notion of sovereignty and a unity pe uh, pe unitary people and allows the people of Northern Ireland to feel and to act as British, Irish, European according to the need. So that what was a zero-sum game, either you're Irish or British, either it's the Union or it's a united Ireland, that is dissolved in a European framework which provides the vocabulary uh, for doing this. And the European Union did not intervene a great deal in the Northern Ireland peace process, but that language and that idea of multiple sovereignty and multiple layers of government is absolutely critical as an intellectual underpinning of the peace process. And if you go back to talking about sovereignty again in Northern Ireland, immediately you run into very, very deep trouble. Similarly in Scotland, Europe provided some notion of a third way between nationalists and unionists. We can agree about European Union, we can dissolve our disagreements into that, Scotland can act in European networks in various ways, Brussels is a counterpoint to London, we can play them off in various ways. Again, independence does not become a zero-sum game. This was apparent in the Scottish independence referendum where all the data that we have showed that people felt perfectly happy being in a multiple level union and they didn't got, want to go for a single one, whether it was the UK or whether it was Scotland. That is encouraged by Europe. Take Europe away and that vocabulary, those ideas, then are in trouble. The next item is the fact that European law is entrenched in the devolved settlements in a very strong way. I'm talking about the European Union law and the European Convention on Human Rights, which may be the next thing on the agenda after Brexit. But just sticking to the European Union law, this is unambiguously and directly applicable in the devolved assemblies. It's, there's a doctrine that Westminster is also subject to European law, but that's a bit more argumented there about the doctrine of supremacy. But it's very, very clear in the case of the devolved administrations. Again, this allows Westminster to step aside I should say, most of the litigation about devolution matters and involved European matters uh, and not the constitutional settlement it, itself. The minimum that would have to happen after Brexit is you would have to remove those clauses in the devolution acts. There are several now for Scotland and several for Wales and, and uh, revised ones for Northern Ireland. They, that would have to be taken out. There is no default option there would have to be some mechanism for providing that Scotland, Wales, and Northern Ireland would no longer be subject directly to European law in a context in which Scotland and Northern Ireland have voted to remain. So they've not expressed the willingness. They've not expressed the desire to take those clauses out. So the politics of Brexit then become uh, different. Uh, Wales, of course, did vote to leave, but as, as Joe well, not as explained, there are, there are many issues in Wales as well, many constitutional issues that are still to be uh, resolved. And then finally, there's the whole question about the consent for 
Brexit. We've got the Supreme Court decision coming up next week. Does Parliament need to approve the triggering of Article 50, which starts the process of leaving the European Union? There's the great repeal bill proposed at the end of the process. It's somewhat mislaid, misnamed. It's not a repeal bill. It actually incorporates European law into UK law. The question before the Supreme Court, the main question is whether Westminster needs to approve the first one. There's also an intervention by the Scottish Government and by individuals in Northern Ireland, because the Northern Ireland Executive uh, did not get its act together even before it collapsed last week. But in relation to Northern Ireland and Scotland, a demand that the devolved parliaments would have to approve that as well, under the so-called Seoul Convention and under the Good Friday Agreement, which says that any change in their powers must be approved by those assemblies themselves. It's only a convention, but conventions are what the British Constitution is dependent uh, upon. Now, we don't know what the outcome of that will be. Probably the Supreme Court will say Westminster has to be consulted on Article 50. The devolves, we don't know. But certainly at the end of the process, this will become a big issue. The convention has stuck so far. It was entrenched only last year in an act of parliament in respect to Scotland. The same it will be done in relation to Wales in due course and in Northern Ireland. If Westminster is simply saying, no, we can take you out of the European Union without your parliaments giving consent either to the principle or the package, you've got a constitutional crisis on your hands, and we don't know how that is going to be resolved. The constitutional, British constitution we know is mostly unwritten. It's conventions, it's ideas. People make up things as they go along. What we're seeing at the moment is people making up constitutional doctrines every day of the week. So we're in for an interesting time when it comes to the British constitution, and we have no idea what the outcome is likely to be.